So good morning, everybody. Welcome to Radio Sofia. I am Kranti Nanduri. I'm a PhD student in Economics Group at IIM Calcutta. So Radio Sofia is an online platform to discuss socio-economic and political issues. And this doctoral lab series is one of its key segments, and it is exclusively dedicated to research scholars in the fields of management and social sciences. We host talks and workshops on interesting topics, theories, and methods to facilitate learning and interaction among the PhD students, faculty, and even researchers outside academic institutions within India and abroad. And today we have with us Mr. Anirudh Tagat and Dr. Hansika Kapoor who talk on the topic experimental social science in India and overview. And uh, so I now hand it over to Himadri to introduce the speakers and to moderate the session. Over to you. Thank you, Kranti. Uh, so, yeah, welcome all to this session on uh, experimental social science. Now, we, we are going through times currently where uh, the government, the policymakers, the bureaucrats, uh, the uh, pharmaceutical companies, and doctors all are busy with a certain buzzword, and that buzzword is experiment. They're experimenting with vaccines, they're experimenting with drugs, and it doesn't get more appropriate to have a session today on experiments in social science, and that too being taken by an economist as well as a psychologist. So today I was actually going through one of the articles uh, in, on LinkedIn, and I just came across a beautiful line I would like to share with you all, where somebody wrote, that you can't just rely on the invisible hand of the market. You can't just rely on the visible hand of the state. You also need the invisible heart of the society. And possibly that's why we have both an economist and a psychologist to lead the session today. So uh, our speakers for today, Dr. Hansika Kapoor, she has completed her BA in psychology from St. Xavier's College, her MA in clinical psychology from the University of Mumbai, and has a PhD in psychology from IIT Bombay. She is a published author, practicing psychologist, and her teaching and her research interests lie in individual differences, creativity, and behavioral economics. Mr. Anirudh Tagar is currently a PhD student at IIT Bombay, IIT, uh, Monash Academy, and he has completed his MS, MSc in Economics from the University of Warwick, U UK. His research interests lie in intra-household bargaining dynamics, experimental game theory, and cultural analysis of uh, decision-making. So uh, uh, apart from these qualifications of our distinguished speakers, I would also like to mention that our speakers actually uh, lead an organization by the name of Monk Prayog Shala. And it's an amazing organization, as I understand from the website, wherein they are not only involved in armchair research, as what we, most of us, are involved in, but also in hands-on, on-ground research. So I'm sure they'll speak more on that. So over to you, the speakers, Mr. Uh, Anirudh and Dr. Hansika. The stage is all yours. Hey. Uh, thank, thanks so much, Himadri and uh, Kanti. Um, I just have a set of slides that I'd like to share. Um, it's, I think right now it's disabled for, for me, so maybe you can enable it. Yeah, just a second. I, I, yeah. I'll do it. I think I can uh, make you a host and then you can. Yeah. yeah. Okay, lovely. Um, thanks so much, uh, Himadri and Kanti and everyone at Radio Sophia for for having us. This is uh, this is uh, this is an incredible honor, and uh, we're uh, we're particularly grateful to uh, Jafar Beg, who's at Final Mind. He's uh, he's the one who connected us with uh, with you guys. So, uh, thanks so much, and for the lovely introduction as well. Uh, I think uh, not not uh, not many people would uh, would cover the whole thing as you did. So, thanks so much for that. Um, I think uh, what what we'll briefly do is just in introduce a little bit uh, about the company that we work with, Monk Prayogshala, and uh, following that, we'll we'll start off on talking about experimental uh, experiments and the experimental method. Um, so, 
Uh, so Mang Prayagshala is primarily a not-for-profit academic research organization. And as um, you know, as Himaji put it in, in a very eloquent way, it's, it's kind of a, it kind of aims to bring in this um, much needed practicality to academic research in India. Um, and we, we are mainly comprised of research authors, research assistants, research interns who work in the areas of psychology, sociology, economics, um, political science, public policy, all of these places. And um, usually the idea is to have an interdisciplinary and cross-disciplinary approach to uh, the work that we do. Um, and typically that involves um, all of us. And like you can see in this in this webinar itself, uh, HK and I work together on, on a variety of research where she provides uh, input from the psychology point of view or behavioral science point of view. And I sort of uh, do it from uh, more of an economics point of view. Um, uh, just to give you a sense of uh, the different kind of um, uh, universities and organizations that we work with, and hopefully we'll, uh, in some of the some of the experiments that we'll be talking about, we talk about how we um, collaborated with um, some of these organizations and kind of uh, with the with the view of hopefully highlighting um, a way forward for sort of doing more experiments and encouraging people to do more experiments in India. Um, uh, primarily, our resources are sort of relying on statistical, experimental sort of databases, and uh, we, like I said, we have a, a trained set of full-time and part-time personnel. And primarily, we are based out of uh, Mumbai, and which doubles up as our laboratory, as the name suggests, Prayogshala is laboratory in Hindi. Um, and one of the main things that really drive uh, the research that we do um, are our processes, and we kind of uh, pride ourselves on on these things. And also, given that most of and as we'll as we'll talk about as we go along in today's uh, in today's webinar as well is um, talking about how ethics uh, is is particularly important. Maintaining participant um, data confidentiality is very very important, especially when you're doing experiment with human subjects. And this is something that we recognize and acknowledge, and we adhere uh, to the uh, American Psychological Association's um, ethics code as well. Um, these are just some of our broad sort of goals and values. Um, all of this is there on our Facebook or on our Twitter if you want to uh, read more about kind of what is, uh, what's the driving force behind, um, behind our goals and objectives. Um, much like, uh, much like uh, academic research anywhere else in the world or anywhere else in, in a university or in any other setting, uh, we follow or we look at each research project as following a particular type of life cycle. Um, and typically this goes through this and if you're a researcher, you're probably aware of this in many ways already and essentially we try and identify a problem and then identify a method that we could use to kind of understand this problem better and you know that can traverse through qualitative, quantitative, mixed methods type of stuff and um, we implement this appropriate methodology on the basis of what we find um, that's already state of art in the literature. And based on the data collected, we kind of go and analyze, use some uh, statistical tools, use um, other tools of um, analysis to kind of uh, get our insights and get our main findings. And the idea is that uh, we put this out in usually typically in the form of, a, of an academic research paper, uh, but uh, quite so as, uh, as we were discussing uh, earlier on, and as Imadi pointed out, we do try and, one of the main things that we try and do is to communicate this research in a way that's, um, accessible to the general public as well. So not just in the, so most of our output is not just in the form of a research paper, it's also sometimes um, in the form of a popular press article that we might publish uh, as a shorter kind of analytical piece. Um, and then of course we get we get feedback and you know, as we go along with today, some of the case studies that we hope to present today of our own experiences with doing experiments in India, um, hopefully that will um, that'll become obvious. Um, just a small snapshot of the different areas that we're working in. Um, these are categorized by the department as of now, but in general, you can think of this as uh, things that sometimes do uh, meld into each other. Um, the one in the middle is, is the work that um, I lead in economics, and the one on the left is um, a part of the work that my colleague um, Hansika leads in psychology, and the one on the right most is sociology. That's led by my colleague Samuti. Um, Again, just an idea of the different project, and I'll, I'll actually have a chance to talk about a few of these uh, when we when we discuss uh, some of the experiments that we did, and some more importantly, some of the lessons that we learned uh, from the experiments that we did, uh, because uh, every 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 experiment that we do, we we learn a lot more uh, as as the experimental method is supposed to do. Um, and yeah, like I said, these are these are some of our publications. Um, and the diversity of areas that we work in and also the diversity of publications 
uh, that we tend to uh, target in our work. Um, yeah. Um, and yeah, just to close, I mean, just a snapshot of sort of what we've been doing um, since, well, not since we started out, but in the in the past year at least, uh, these are our sort of milestones of progress. And um, if, you know, we, we'd love to chat more about if any of you have any questions about us and if you'd like to sort of learn or be involved in any way, um, we'd, we'd love to, uh, we'd love to talk more. And I will hand it over to Hansika now to uh, take over on the experiments. Awesome. Uh, thank you, Adi. And uh, thank you, Kranti and Himadri for uh, this opportunity, of course, because I think this uh, is a phenomenal platform for researchers and um, early career researchers, especially to uh, connect. So this is a brief outline of uh, what we have planned for um, about a 25 to 30 minute uh, talk after which we'll of course be very happy to take uh, questions. So we will be talking about the experimental method or what are the principles of experimentation and then we have a couple of uh, experiments uh, and examples rather that we've done in the lab in the field as well as uh, natural experiments that we can that we can talk about. So what is uh, experimental social science? It's, um, as, as a psychologist, uh, and in case you have any uh, friends and colleagues who uh, are psychologists, you may have been bombarded by their requests to come in and participate in uh, their studies. Uh, we learn experimental uh, psychology. I mean, it's a core part of our bachelor's, our master's, our, of course, uh, higher education. Um, but what's happening is that the experimental method is now expanding to uh, other uh, social sciences as well. And it, um, it, all, it all came from this uh, physics envy that uh, social scientists really have. Uh, I mean, as a psychologist, there's also economics envy because that is, the, uh, that is the epitome of the social sciences. But now economists as well have started um, adapting uh, experiments and using the experimental uh, method to answer, uh, answer their research questions that may not necessarily be answered by um, conducting large scale surveys. So it try, the experimental method in essence uh, tries to establish causality wherein, um, wherein a change or a manipulation in one variable uh, leads to a measurable change in another uh, variable. And um, this can only be uh, observed and assessed under certain conditions such as uh, in a laboratory or um, certain control conditions. So, uh, moving on, there are some general principles of uh, experimentation. Um, as this comic strip actually uh, uh, suggests, uh, experimentation is um, not necessarily just trial and error. I mean, um, a very famous uh, child psychologist uh, Jean Piaget said that children in essence are just tiny scientists. They're just trying to figure out how the world works and they're just trying to understand this cause effect relationship between if I, if I throw a ball down, if I throw a ball off the table, does it go down or does it go up and things like that. Uh, but obviously as, as uh, a professional <laughs> researchers and scientists, you do um, perform experiments to identify whether a tweak in one variable leads to measurable and measurable changes uh, in another variable under uh, certain uh, circumstances and settings. And of course, there are experiments that don't go your way. And um, that happens, I mean, more often than you would like to admit, or we would like to admit rather. Um, next. Uh, so in essence, there are uh, three types of experiments, so laboratory experiments, and these uh, differ on the basis of setting as well as on the basis of who's doing the manipulation of that first variable. So laboratory experiments, as the name suggests, are experiments that are conducted within um, the sterile environment of a laboratory, um, as any of you would have, uh, would have witnessed in um, school or in undergraduate and, and things like that. So a lab experiment is exactly that. It's done in a laboratory where the experimenter has complete control over the environment and uh, settings and can manipulate certain variables to 
measure their effect on other variables. Uh, field experiments, on the other hand, are um, they have a little less control because you're actually going out into the natural environment, into a field environment wherein you're trying to um, replicate the conditions of a laboratory, but also create a sense of um, naturalization or, or create a sense of um, adaptability to the actual context. So as we'll describe one of our field experiments later in uh, this talk, you'll also understand how we try to create a lab in the field while trying to maintain the conditions and the controls of a laboratory, but doing it in a field setting that would be definitely more comfortable for uh, participants. Uh, then finally, there are natural experiments wherein um, wherein the variable that is cha that changes or that is manipulated is actually a function of what happened in in the world like you can consider covid to be a natural experiment you can consider um the shift in um i mean talks and webinars like these where uh, earlier we may have been invited to come in and uh, speak at imc here we're doing it online so this is um the, the impact of COVID on learning, teaching, interacting, socializing, all of that, that is in essence um, a natural experiment. So there are certain general principles of uh, experimentation which we will go through really quickly. Uh, randomization is essentially uh, the principle that suggests that any individual should be randomly assigned to either the treatment group or the control group. Now, what are these words? A treatment group is basically the group in which um, a variable has been manipulated or uh, considered in, in the sense of a drug trial, all right? So in a drug trial, you would, uh, or in a clinical trial, consider the case of uh, the COVID-19 vaccine. Um, there would be drug A versus drug B. Now, uh, and there would be a comparison between the two of vaccine A versus vaccine B, and there would be a comparison between uh, the two. So randomization essentially means that any individual who, has, uh, who is part of your participant pool is randomly assigned to either the treatment or treatment A or treatment B. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean that you are going to select or pre-select that, okay, this person has better health status and therefore they should go into the group that I think would do better or the drug that I think I, that it would do better. So random assignment is just randomly, literally randomly assigning your participants to either the treatment uh, group or the control group. In the case of the vaccine example, I didn't say that there would be a control group because it would be unethical to not give them any treatment at all, as this cartoon suggests. So it's not like you give one group of fourth graders a good education and the other ones a placebo treatment where I, I don't know what they would watch uh, all day in lieu of uh, studying. But randomization is exactly, is exactly that. And another very important principle of um, experimentation on the next slide is that of control. And um, control, as I said, is the environment within which, it's a really good cartoon, is uh, the environment within which the experimenter does do their uh, study. So we have complete control over the laboratory in which we're doing our experiment. We invite participants to come into the lab, but we, have, we are in charge of, of the lab. We can change the temperature, we can change the lighting, we can, uh, give one person a slower computer as compared to the other and see whether their frustration levels are being affected or not. It really sounds like we can play act uh, a supreme being or a supreme entity, but the point is that control is very important so that we can only manipulate what we want to manipulate and control for the other variables that can, in effect, uh, can affect uh, the measured variable. Which then comes to the final uh, one of the final principles of uh, experimentation, which is measurement. And measurement is extremely crucial because uh, we are literally trying to measure or estimate what is being changed because of something that we ourselves have uh, manipulated. So uh, measurement can take uh, several forms. Obviously, you can measure, uh, you can measure heart rate, you can measure um, 
reaction time, you can measure accuracy, you can measure in, in some of the laboratory experiments that we'll talk about, you can measure whether people are going to punish another person or not. And measurement will obviously vary and change depending on the nature of the experiment that, uh, that you've designed. So moving on to lab uh, experiments, what are they? We're, we're in our lab codes, we're waiting, we've entered the, the lab, like what are we supposed to do now? Uh, lab experiments are essentially the type of experiments that I've been describing uh, throughout. They have fundamental characteristics of uh, control, um, of uh, uh, specific designs of randomization of a treatment group, of a control group, of um, of variables that will be manipulated or selected that will then affect uh, the measure the measured uh, variable and uh, but, but at the same time there are certain uh, limits uh, to laboratory experiments and um, those can include um, I, I think this is on the next slide I'm those those can include um, obviously whether your participant base has been uh, sampled accurately, whether it is representative enough, whether it is adequate in size of the sample in question that you want to eventually generalize the results of your experiment to. Remember, an experiment is, um, you're not going to experiment the entire population. You're going, to, you're going to identify a subsample or a subset of the population, which is your sample, on, the, on whom you are going to be doing your experiment. So it's very, very crucial to understand whether that sample is representative in nature and adequate in size as in, in relation to the general population. Um, now, because the environment of the experiment is so sterile, it is in a laboratory, it has very little real world um, features, for instance. Uh, the external validity or the generalizability of the results of your experiment to real life behavior is in question, which is why field experiments are very, very popular because they're trying to create that kind of realism that does not exist in a sterile uh, laboratory environment. Um, some also argue that they're unrealistic, they're artificial because they oversimplify uh, reality. Um, the example that we'll give after this would, would make that clear where we're going to be discussing an experiment that uh, was being run on, uh, run on how people punish others for antisocial behavior. Now, obviously, trying to mimic that um, uh, social interaction in an experimental setting would have to reduce that behavior or that interpersonal um, interpersonal behavior to a very, very uh, simplified format. And it's difficult to do that, which is why one of the criticisms is that laboratory experiments just won't be able to generalize um, outside. But at the same time, whether uh, the experiment is supposed to be real or how real it's supposed to be depends really on the purpose of the experiment. Because at the end of the day, an experiment is only going to be an abstraction of a social phenomena that you are going to be able to study. That abstraction is what you can then generalize across, um, across other real life or real world uh, situations. So in the lab, uh, what we had done, this is our uh, colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Jonathan Schulz, um, who was, I believe, at Yale University at the time uh, when we were doing the experiments and uh, now, is, uh, now is an assistant professor in the US. Uh, he had come down and he had uh, uh, gotten in touch with us to do these experiments, these lab experiments on antisocial punishment. And as you can see, the setup is, it looks a bit strange, but the thing was that these cardboard dividers, etc., were created. And this is a general classroom. I, I, I forget which college, but this is a general classroom uh, uh, set, set seating. And behind each divider was a computer screen and a keyboard and a mouse, etc. So this was a computer lab. But these dividers were very essential so that participants did not peek into what other people were doing, etc. Because this was, and once I describe the game, you'll understand why it was so important for them to be confined to these uh, little makeshift cubicles. So what we were trying to do is figure out in a public goods uh, game, which is basically an experimental game in which 
um, people can people have an initial endowment. They can put in some part of that endowment into a public pot. If whatever they put into that public pot will get uh, doubled or tripled or whatever it is, and then redistributed amongst uh, the group. Uh, you can see very clearly that there can be free riders in this case, so people who don't put in anything but then just reap the rewards of what other people have put in. Um, so what this experiment did was actually allow, allow you to see who had contributed what and allowed you to punish free riders. <laughs> so this obviously, and this was, I think, if I remember correctly, was a cross-cultural study. So we were the India um, set of, like, we were responsible for recruiting the Indian set of participants. But you can understand also that, as I said, the, an experimental setup is going to do just the abstraction of uh, a, a social phenomena, a social behavior that then can be generalized to other settings. Um, on the next slide, we have what we learned really from uh, this experiment. And um, it was, we, we did it in a few colleges in uh, Mumbai city. And um, we learned that planning, uh, planning the experiment or making sure that logistics run smoothly, that um, there are enough personnel from our end uh, for troubleshooting that language is taken care of and things like that is very, very important. And um, taking care of contingencies such as, um, what are they called? The Wi-Fi connections that they, uh, jammers. Jammers in colleges are a very big uh, issue. So we had to basically go in with our own routers and our own um, internet connections and those were also getting jammed and things like that. So it was an experimental setup that relied on a local area network. And that was, that was a big, big learning. And uh, obviously we learned a lot about recruitment and scheduling and making sure that a room of 24 participants was filled with 24 participants because that entire cycle of the experiment took an hour. And if that room was not full with 24, that meant that we missed out collecting uh, collecting data from some participants. So uh, that that's the that's the lab experiment that that's at least one of the lab experiments that uh, we did as part of as part of uh, our study. And also because um, we we also learned how to reimburse participants and um, pay participants and ca like what cash management and uh, payment structures and things like that. So it was, it was a very big protocol. Like we had a script uh, that everybody was trained in to follow so that we made sure that uh, the processes move, moved on smoothly. I think I'm going to uh, hand it over to Anirudh to talk about field and actual experiments now. Uh, thanks, Hanshika. Sorry. Uh, so I, I was seeing some questions coming up in the chat. So I mean, th these are wonderful questions. I will take them. Um, if 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 it's okay, everyone will probably take them. And once we finish talking, because we don't have uh, really that much to uh, talk about, except for a few cases and a few examples. Uh, which after which we we'd actually love to take up some of these issues that you guys are bringing up for sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, uh, Hanshika has uh, basically kind of described uh, what a lab experiment. Uh, broadly entails um, and sort of looking at um, what are the different challenges that we faced uh, in the couple of uh, rather in the few lab experiments that we've helped with and the, some of them that we've done for our own studies. Um, now the 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 main sort of uh, the the second sort of category of experiments that we that we typically talk about at least in experimental social science and more so in experimental economics um, relates to field experiments, um, and within field experiments there are kind of these two types you know further two distinctions within field experiments if you could call it that. So one is typically called uh, the lab in the field experiment, which uh, HK mentioned briefly, um, which is, as the name suggests, it's also called artifactual field experiment, but that name is a little bit more uh, technical. Um, but the idea is that essentially in this type of experiment, you are taking um, the laboratory or a laboratory setting, and you're basically taking it to the field. Now, taking it to the field can mean, can mean many different things. Um, you could essentially taking it to the field essentially means adding more context to the exper uh, to the to the experiment, right? So, um, as HK mentioned, in lab experiments, you have this sterile kind of abstract environment, right? So we're trying to grapple with this: how do we strike the balance between um, some task that basically tells us whether somebody will punish somebody else or not, 
um, how do we take that abstract type of task in a lab experiment and then bring it out to the real world, right? So this is what a field experiment or a, even a lab in the field experiment is, is currently trying to do in the sense that it's trying to get to the uh, kind of trying to move the needle a little bit farther away from the abstract part of it and a little bit more closer to the realism. Um, and there were some questions about external validity, which is which is very true, but in the sense that this is kind of a push towards being a little bit more um, externally valid, a little bit more generalizable. Um, and the idea here is that um, essentially you might take a task or you might take a protocol that you might follow exactly in the lab and you just bring it out into the field. Uh, bringing it out, like I said, into the field could mean that you have a maybe a specialized subject sample, right? So maybe you're interested right now, for example, in COVID-19 times, uh, you might be interested in how um, medical professionals take decisions, right? In maybe in high risk scenarios or maybe in the scenarios where they're under a tremendous amount of pressure or strain from an external source. Um, so essentially, you could have them play uh, a game, a game in the sense of an experiment. Um, that you might otherwise play in the lab, but then kind of bring it out to them so that they can uh, sort of make their decisions. So then you'd be specifically kind of studying what these individuals and how they react um, to these uh, situations as well. Uh, the other thing that you can do, which is what I'm going to describe, is kind of the field experiment that we did uh, in rural Tamil Nadu. So um, here, basically, we were interested in understanding um, how husbands and wives uh, take decisions uh, related to household matters. Um, and this, this field of economics is broadly called inter-household bargaining, inter-household allocation, you might call it that. And basically what we did was to take um, what's called, um, well, kind of like a setting up an experimental shop. So basically the, in the photo that you're seeing, um, our experimenters are the ones with the pens and papers and they're sitting essentially with an order form. And on the table, you can't exactly see it in this photo, but they have a set of commodities that um, households and household members can choose from. Um, and essentially, we were interested in understanding how husbands and wives might differ in how they choose particular commodities to buy. Um, and we were also trying to understand how, you know, if they share information with each other on what they were going to buy, does that make a difference for um, ultimately what kinds of things uh, they choose to buy? Right. So um, that's that's kind of the main objective that we went with. And essentially, we tried to replicate what you saw in the earlier photo, which is kind of having these private booths or sort of private cubicles for individuals to make decisions. It's just that we couldn't uh, sort of bring into, uh, well, bring to the lab this kind of um, cubicle that you saw in the earlier experiment. Um, but we still kind of, it's important for sort of decision making to be independent and kind of free of any external stimuli, et cetera. So we made them kind of sit far away from each other um, so that they cannot interact. And we also had another person who's not in this photo, but he was he or she was always there and trying to make sure that um, there was no sort of interaction outside of what the experiment um, was looking at. Um, there, of course, with the with the sort of understanding that you take a lab experiment to the field, there are obviously going to be new types of challenges uh, because nothing is um, nothing is really without um, <laughs> nothing nothing goes up perfectly in the first stage, right? So, uh, one of the main things that we that we learned here is that you that the sort of especially since we kind of took it to a to a rural area in Tamil Nadu, uh, it's very very important to have a local partner who might be able to help you with um, sort of setting up the experiment, understanding the local context, um, and that goes a long way in basically helping one to understand. Uh, what are the different challenges that you can face when you're trying to implement this experiment, right? So A, of course, all of our languages and, uh, sorry, all of the experimental instructions that everything was translated to the local language. Um, and also for context, uh, all our enumerators were trained so that they could, you know, speak in the same language and that they could make people understand that this is what you're expected to do. Um, but at the same time, uh, the kind of task that we were doing required us to set up an experimental shop. So we had to buy all of these different commodities before we kind of got there, right? Because uh, chances were that in that village or in a particular district, we may not find the exact same, um, may not find the exact same commodities that we wanted to put in our shop. And that was very important to the experiment, right? So I can't offer, say if I was offering uh, notebooks, I can't offer one brand of notebooks in one village and then offer a different brand of notebooks in a different village because then those two things are no longer comparable, right? The person might be choosing it because of um, some other feature uh, related to that commodity. Um, and the other thing that we faced, which is quite interesting, was um, this information spread, right? So because a village is a very tightly knit social network, um, 
it's very, very difficult to do an experiment and not have other people find out that somebody is doing an experiment in, in your village. Uh, we chose to set up our lab in the school um, because mainly because the facilities, electricity, benches, and sort of this, um, you know, availability of potentially, you know, having some sort of discrete spaces. Um, but the main thing was that everybody heard about the fact that we were doing this and they said that, no, we want to participate, we want to participate. And we had already sort of chosen the individuals who we wanted to invite um, because A, they had to be only married couples and B, they had to be married couples that met certain criteria for our experiment. Um, and that really brings to four ethical issues that could come up when you go to a village like this and do an experiment, right? So, and typically in an experiment, like Hansika was also mentioning about payment, we always, uh, at least in economics, we typically sort of um, provide an incentive to the participant for the time that they spend in participating in the experiment. Um, and in villages that might be particularly, you know, make or break for somebody deciding to participate in an experiment or not, because it might involve them uh, taking time off from work, taking time off from childcare, um, coming from a farm that is might probably a little bit far away, they might have to take a bus or something like this, right? So um, those are the reasons why we essentially provide an incentive. And the idea is that um, it, it, it it can go sort of different ways. And that's why having this ethical, cl sorry, clarity on ethical issues uh, prior to entering the field and sort of uh, addressing all of those different issues is um, super important. Um, the other type of sort of experiments that we talk about when we talk about um, broadly experimental social science is this idea of natural experiments. As HK was mentioning, uh, we might have uh, what's a um, sort of exogenous sort of shock um, to a variable of interest or an exogenous variation in it. Uh, COVID-19 is certainly an exogenous variation because one could argue that nobody saw a pandemic coming um, and therefore um, any, any sort of change in behavior that, or any sort of change in, a, in an outcome that occurs um, after COVID was sort of um, declared a pandemic maybe, um, that could be, you could argue that that was completely exogenous. It's the same with, um, in economics, for example, demonetization, because essentially not many people knew that demonetization was a policy that was going to happen. Um, so the announcement was completely um, abrupt and it could not be sort of um, foreseen. So therefore you could call it an exogenous shock. Um, so in this sense, people who received this kind of shock, could you could call them as the treatment group and people who did not receive this type of shock, you could call them as the control group. Um, and the other thing that you could do is also look at the same person, but before and after the shock as well, right? So this is what's called a within group design more broadly. Um, and you could do, yeah, so you could do a whole different types of comparisons between the same two types of, um, same two types of groups. Um, and that's, that's kind of the, it's just that one of the, I think I have a slide on that. Okay, well, this is uh, this is an interesting comic that kind of summarizes what the what some of the issues with uh, natural experiments and RCTs might be. And RCTs is a randomized control trial. I have a slide on it right after this. Um, but in essence, um, you know, the the idea is that uh, it's in a natural experiment or in an RCT. Sometimes people don't know that they're part of an experiment, right? So. Um, if we are, if you and I as researchers might be studying the effect of COVID-19 shock on say um, how much economic mobility, uh, not economic mobility, how much mobility there is out, outdoors, like how many people are moving from their house to another place. Um, you and I might be part of that data set, but we don't know that we're being, we're being studied in the context of COVID-19, right? So um, that's, that's always kind of, it's always kind of uh, one thing and it, it's kind of a pro as well as a con in the sense if you don't know that you're part of an experiment you may act more naturally you may not sort of um, have this potential sort of bias that oh somebody's observing my behavior so maybe i shouldn't do anything but at the same time it brings up some ethical issues in the sense that you you don't really you're not really taking consent from these individuals um, prior to observing how they behave or their data um so yeah th this is from a comic called uh, saturday morning practice serial um it's, it's one of my favorite comics because he he comes up with a lot of different um, uh, crit critiques of economics and um, yeah, as an economist, I love that. So, um, okay. So last bit on RCTs. Um, so this has become like a very popular way of um, studying policy, especially policy in the developing world. Um, that's because um, essentially it takes the, takes the idea of a clinical trial like um, Himadri was talking about earlier on. Uh, and it takes it to the it takes it to the field it takes it to the real world and the the objects of um, 
so, sort of the way that we randomize is that we either randomize across individuals or you might randomize across clusters. And I'll talk a little bit about how you might do that. Um, but the idea is that receiving the policy, for example, uh, but receiving it as a result of being in this randomized treatment group, right? So in the sense that the the reason that you are in a treatment group is not because of any other characteristic of yours, except that you were randomly selected. So um, that's that's one of the reasons that you received this policy. And then the reason that you're in the control group is again for no particular reason, except that you were uh, assigned to the. So the, only, the what we try to do in in an RCT is try to make sure that we have um, a no sort of. Uh, uh, substantial differences between the groups. Um, if you if you'll read any paper in economics or policy or anything like that that uses an RCT, you'll always find this table called a balance table. And a balance table is essentially trying to tell us that look, on average, the treatment group and the control group are not very different. Um, that's that's what at least that's what it's trying to show. Right. So. Um, yeah. So this is kind of one way in which. Um, Sorry, I don't know what's with the animation. So uh, one of the ways in which uh, this uh, RCTs are kind of designed in terms of uh, in terms of thinking about experimental design is that you could have a simple RCT. So like we discussed earlier, you have one treatment group and you have one control group. Um, the unit at which you're randomizing largely comes down to the question that you're asking, right? So if you're interested in sort of the impact of um, providing benches to schools, then you would randomize at the school level where basically you know you assign a set of 100 schools to receive benches and maybe another set of 100 schools to not receive benches and you do this uh, randomly and you have only two groups so basically then you're comparing a set of schools that got the benches versus a set of schools uh, that did not get the benches um, you could also have multi-treatment sort of groups so where you basically have maybe instead of one treatment group you have sort of two treatment groups so you get a bench and um, you get um, so one gets a bench, one gets blackboard, and one gets none of these two. So then you're sort of looking at what's the effect of uh, benches versus what's the effects of blackboards, and then uh, trying to compare that with what happened in the treatment group. Um, the factorial design is a little bit different in the sense that you're then combining two treatments, right? So you're trying to understand uh, what is happening, um, what's happening in addition to an existing treatment. So an example is, let's uh, sticking to the schools example. So you could say that, I give one group um, uh, the benches, and in the other group, I give them benches and blackboards. So essentially, you're between group A and group B, you might be studying the difference between uh, what happens, what is the incremental effect of sort of providing them with blackboards in addition to just giving them benches, right? So that's that's a factorial type of design. So you can think of it as an interaction type thing. Um, the cluster randomization is essentially where you um, sort of uh, randomize at the cluster level in the sense that you maybe, uh, instead of taking individual schools, you might take a cluster of schools. For example, cluster of schools in a particular district, uh, cluster of schools that might have certain characteristics, et cetera, et cetera, right? So um, that's one way in which you could design your randomization as well. Um, there is an encouragement design, and uh, in essence, that is supposed to be something where you encourage others to come and participate um, in uh, in either the treatment group or the control group. So, in the sense that you're you're not you're not exactly randomizing their um, their participation, but rather you know sort of their invitation into um, into a particular group, either um, treatment or control group. And pipeline is uh, a more how to say, a little bit more um, ethical in the sense that uh, you don't have a pure control group that it might not be appropriate to perhaps exclude a certain set of schools uh, to be in the control group and not give them anything. So if you're, say, if you're a government or if you're, a, if you're an NGO or if you're a donor and you say that, oh, all these schools should get laptops tomorrow, um, but, uh, but you're still, as a researcher, you might be interested in understanding how do we still test the effect of laptops. So the way to do that is to do it in what's called a pipeline method or a phase-wise method where basically in the first phase, you give a certain set of schools laptops, then in the second phase, you expand that to the next set of schools, then to the next set of schools. So by the end of the experiment, you have all the schools receiving laptops, but you're still able to compare sort of the first group that received the laptops with other groups that may not have received laptops at that same time. Um, in terms of threshold, how am I doing for time? Okay, well, I should probably wrap up soon. Um, but in terms of the threshold, it's, it's essentially like a way of thinking about uh, if you have a below poverty line measure, for example, and it's difficult for you to sort of compare those below poverty line with those above poverty line, because there may be other differences between these two. Uh, what you typically do is to sort of set a threshold that's slightly above the 
PPL threshold, for example, um, and then randomize within that sort of group. So you have you basically have a much narrower fraction of people participating in your study, um, and you're trying to understand what is the incremental maybe effect of some design, uh, some some intervention, something like this. Um, yeah, so I've already talked about that. Um, and this is sort of a case of what we did in terms of, so we, we haven't sort of run a full blown uh, RCT, but we did have experience with um, what might be an essential first step in moving towards an RCT. Um, so uh, we were trying to kind of basically set up a way um, to understand what are the behavioral factors that affect latrine adoption in rural Odisha. And uh, we received a grant from CIE for this and we were working with the team and basically what we did was to approach a local NGO, which was Gram Vikas. And what we did was to kind of um, look at the different sociocultural sort of um, elements that were involved in the decision to ad adopt latrines or use the latrines. So because Swachh Bharat had built a lot of latrines, but um, in this particular environment, a lot of them weren't being used. They were used as basically as storehouses or as something else. So we were trying to understand what are the different factors. So I think the only, the main takeaway from this, and I won't spend too much time on it, but I'm, I'll be happy to discuss it later. But the main takeaway from it was um, in order for us to find out what kind of intervention we wanted to design in an RCT, um, it was important for us to actually do some qualitative research beforehand. Um, and this is something that we, we, we often don't hear about, but I think it's a very good approach because it really informs the researcher uh, much more about the context in which they're about to intervene, right? And that's, that's very important um, for, us to, for us to design effective interventions. Um, that's a nice photo from, from the field. Um, yeah, I'm not going to go into this, but there is something called A-B testing that firms have been using for a pretty long time. Uh, I'd be happy to talk about that if anybody specifically has interest. Um, yeah, so this is our, our Q&A slide, and these are just some kind of key takeaways. Um, but uh, yes, uh, thanks so much. Uh, thanks so much for thanks so much for having us. I will just hand back host rights to Kramri. I think that's yeah, and um, yes, uh, thank you for um, letting us show you what we've done <laughs> in the past. <laughs> uh, I think there's a bunch of questions in the chat that we'd be happy to take on um, now. So uh, I think Akash asked, was the genesis story of Prayogshala Fascinating to know why and how this was set up and the motivation and the vision of the organization. So um, Prayogshala was, um, uh, I mean, we, we've been, uh, in, we were incorporated in 2011, um, but uh, the first two years were when I was finishing my master's, honestly. So there wasn't a lot of time that I could uh, give to setting up, except just setting up the operations of the company. But um, after that, uh, we formally began uh, work in the Department of Psychology in 2013. Uh, Anirudh uh, joined 2014, establishing the Department of Economics. And the reason why we do it is uh, we realized early on that no one else was uh, doing this. and no one else was filling in this uh, very important gap of um, cutting edge uh, social science uh, research to begin with. We, of course, want to expand into um, the other sciences as well, but especially in social sciences, uh, there wasn't anyone uh, taking it seriously enough. And a personal motivation for me was that every time I got journal uh, table of contents, I did not see an Indian's uh, name. And if I did see an Indian's name, uh, they were probably affiliated uh, to a university in the West. So that was that was a personal motivation to make sure that uh, Indian researchers uh, from India were publishing in high-end uh, journals. And uh, you also asked how doctoral students and early career researchers can get involved. I'm going to post a number of uh, links here to our website and the ways in which you can uh, get involved. Uh, but I'm going to hand it over to AT for what would be the future of field experiments post COVID. Um, yeah, I think Himadri or Kanti, I guess you guys were going to say something. Yeah, yeah. I think we just took up the question. Sorry, I just lost connection some, uh, because my supervisor had just called me. Uh, so oh, okay. I'm, I'm really, really <laughs> sorry. Yeah, that's a valid <laughs> really reason sorry for that. So. Yeah, yeah, it's a very important <laughs> reason. So anyways, I mean, uh, thank you very much. This was a fascinating session. 
I actually got to learn a lot, uh, especially on the uh, methodological foundations for the experiments and how your case studies fed into those uh, theoretical studies. I mean, while I was actually going through a presentation, I just, uh, I mean, uh, uh, on a lighter note, I came, I just thought about something. I just felt that this COVID thing right now is probably a kind of an experiment by nature where, I mean, like uh, most of your experiments, we are being kept into uh, physical and social distancing. And then the, and then nature is playing the control and uh, uh, the uh, placebo group kind of an experiment. So yeah, I'm just, so we have a host of questions right now. Yes. Uh, I think a couple of them have been already taken, right? Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. So I, we have I, a sorry. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. If you want, I can just take the one. That's fine for us. Yeah. You can. You can go ahead. Yeah. You can go ahead. Yeah. So um, yeah, I think in terms of so Akash asked uh, in terms of external validity requirements, how the use of vignettes used um, in experimental design. So um, there's uh, so vignettes have been, for example, very very frequently used in psychological research uh, for sure and. It forms like actually a core basis of um, some of the variations in treatments as well. Um, in fact, I think that um, HK had a study on um, sort of um, studying sexual assault and victimization that mm -hmm. uh, in fact made use of some of those vignettes. Um, in economics, unfortunately, uh, there's not a lot of um, there's not a lot of studies that seem to have used that, or at least have, that seem to have um, used that in a way that you know, that's the sole variation. So typically, um, at least uh, economists, and I think even in political science a little bit, the, they try to do sort of many things in, in one experiment, whereas um, uh, like, 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 I think like your next question is, which is about sort of factorial design and things like that. So, um, you know, that is, uh, that is something that economists try to do in the sense they try to maximize sort of the number of treatments that they might have in any given study, uh, rather than have many different studies that might use um, those variations. Um, it, the factors that need to be considered while designing and implementing study and keeping in mind study might be replicated by someone else. That's, that's a very good question. So, um, I think the, um, the, I mean, I, I'll, I'll ask HK if he has some more thoughts on the replication crisis, but I mean, in the sense that one of the, one of the major moves that have happened in social science recently, especially related to RCTs is to, um, sort of pre-register your RCT or pre-register your experiment on an online portal. Um, so that you get um, not 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 just so that you get feedback from others, but also because um, then you can uh, sort of make sure that this is the design that you specified, and then this is you know there might be variations between that and finally what you implement. Um, but the idea is that you'll always have a document of um, ultimately what you uh, what you implement uh, what you sort of thought to implement or what you had originally envisioned to in implement. Um, so pre-registration is one thing, and the second thing is of course um, sort of having transparency over all your material. Um, so for example, this this particular field experiment that I was describing, the one in Tamil Nadu, like in our working paper, we put all the all the survey forms, we put in all the instructions that we gave the candidates. Um, the data is supposed to be, I think, publicly available as well. Um, so, so my sense is that we're trying to, um, you know, move, move towards, uh, and that's especially happening in psychology, not so much um, in economics, but the idea is that we are moving towards more of uh, sort of open science, more transparency. So you might not get um, all the studies that have all the materials, all the data, all the code, but you might, we might be moving towards a situation where we at least have um, all of the studies giving, you know, different parts of that. So some of them giving code, some of them giving data, some of them giving questionnaires, et cetera. So um, I think those are, those are things that I would mainly keep in mind. And I think um, Simran, it would be, uh, it would be useful to look at the open science framework, which is OSF, where you can pre-register uh, your study, make your data once the data has been collected available and, and your analysis code and things like that, which is basically part of um, a larger movement which started in psychology but has expanded to other so experimental social sciences uh, to just make sure that there is an, that there isn't um, there, there is free availability of data and resources and instructions, for instance, interview schedules and things like that, so that anyone who wants to replicate uh, the results can do that. So um, OSF also has their own YouTube channel that you can um, check out a couple of videos to understand what pre-registration is all about and just um, work with that, yeah. 
Um, yeah, so I think in terms of fractional factorial designs, I don't have uh, much. So, I mean, we definitely haven't done it in an economics uh, setup for sure. The one that we described, the one with our colleague at, who was at Yale at the time, that did have sort of many different smaller sort of variations in treatment uh, that he was looking at. Um, mm -hmm. But I would say that the main challenge is in sort of in, in most of those designs, and I think HK, if you want, you can add, but I think the main challenge is finding power. So having sort of mm -hmm. adequate sample size so that you can actually say that the treatment um, is the reason for the variation in your outcomes. Um, mm -hmm. That's that's sort of the main challenge because in India, like it's, it's often like we've discussed in almost in both our lab experiments as well as in the lab in the field experiments, recruitment um, is, is a very sort of logistically heavy um, issue. In online studies, and of course now most of COVID-19 stuff means that everything has gone online, but um, the idea is that in online studies may be a little bit more voluntary, right? Because you can't force people to participate in your study, but here you're sort of then formally going and inviting them to your study, et cetera. So um, finding the adequate sample size for each cell in that factorial design, um, that might be uh, a challenge, I would say. And um, just to add, uh, we have, I mean, I have used once a fractional factorial design. It isn't used very often in psychological studies as well. And I do believe that it's used pretty often in uh, natural science experiments because there are so many conditions and you a priori make uh, hypotheses related to specific conditions and specific uh, interactions. But in psychological experiments, you don't have more than three to four variations because the number of interactions is it's uninterpretable uh, eventually but the one in which I did use it was again the sexual assault um, study which um, basically wanted to understand the um, the effect of the relationship between the victim and the perpetrator on whether um, between the victim and the perpetrator on whether the victim would report uh, the assault and we had um, we had two variables so relationship to the victim friend family stranger a relationship to the perpetrator friend family stranger but we consciously excluded the condition where both were family or both were strangers both were family because that would be incest and that was not the gap that was beyond the gamut of our study and strangers because it had no relevance to um, to the to the confidant who was who was going to help them report uh, the assault, etc. So that's the only time that we've used it. Um, but again, as I said, the reason why it isn't used very frequently in um, psychology or I'm assuming even economic studies um, is because we don't have a huge number of manipulated variables because the interactions are just too large um, to deal with. Uh, um, yeah, I think okay. Harshita had a question. Harshita, so, uh, in both rural and yeah, yeah. urban settings with language being a big factor in Indian experiments, have you faced any difficulty with making sure your experiment was ethical? Okay, in terms of participant understanding, have you found any major differences within rural settings? Um, yeah, actually, so we, we actually didn't speak about um, a couple of more recent experiments that we did um, where uh, we did randomize that uh, in, in actually where most of those experiments were in urban areas. Um, so I would say that uh, one of the main things uh, in terms of rural experiments or doing experiments in rural areas is uh, being aware of the context in which you're doing an experiment. So one of uh, one of the main ethical issues that we faced um, a couple of years ago when we were doing, where we were helping out another doctoral student in their experiment that they wanted to do in rural Tamil Nadu um, was that she was varying basically, uh, she was varying or trying to understand sort of uh, intercaste sort of relations um, in, terms of, uh, in terms of a particular experiment. Um, now the problem is that so, uh, it, it, I mean, if you if you ever had the sort of fortune of sort of visiting a village in rural India for any field work or any sort of thing, um, you will know that um, relations are often very uh, distinctly drawn along caste lines, right? So it's 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 far more salient um, in in rural India as compared to urban India. Um, now the idea there is that so in the in that moment, if you're trying to give a or if you're trying to do an experiment that varies reward or payouts in any way to two different social groups, um, then you're obviously going to face a lot of backlash, right? Because then one group can easily stand up and say that, oh, like you're paying them more and you're paying me less or you're giving them X and you're not giving me X. Um, so you have to be like super, super careful about things like that. And, um, you know, in, in, in terms of the, in terms of specific issue that you bring up, um, I would say that um, as long as there's very clear translation. So for, for the experiment that we did in Tamil Nadu, like we 
translated and back translated the instructions about three times. Um, and that's because uh, the first time that we did it, it was just sort of the translation of the instructions. The second time, it was also the translation of the context. So we actually took the uh, Tamil version and we took it to the enumerators and the enumerators were very, actually very good students who were enrolled at a local university. And they actually told us that, okay, so you need to change this. You need to word this differently. Um, this is actually what this is called. You don't actually use this word because it's very formal, et cetera. So those are the kinds of things that that whole thing went through. And then finally we did a pilot test. So um, we didn't talk about it when we were discussing our experiments, but pilot testing is like one of the most important things, especially uh, when you're thinking about doing an experiment in rural India. If you have the chance to do it, um, do a small pilot test if you can before sort of actually going out and rolling the experiment. You, it will give you like the, I mean, it, it might cost a little bit more, but it will give you um, pretty much the entire like idea of what, what kinds of things can go wrong. And that, that's super important, I would say, especially in terms of like sort of ethical issues. In terms of urban siding, we don't have that much. I would say it's um, less logistical sort of issues in the sense of like you acquiring material and things like that is a little bit easier. Um, uh, infrastructure is much better, of course, like you don't have issues with internet or with uh, electricity and things like that. Transport, definitely not the transport. Um, so yeah, I mean, I would say that it's, it's kind of much easier to do an experiment in an urban setting. Um, but at the same time, there are sort of, um, you need a little bit more planning um, in if you were say going to a rural area. So we'll take a last question. Uh, that's by yeah. Dorpoji. Okay. Where, uh, yeah, you can take it down. Uh, when you talk about our cities, one of the major constraints faced is with respect to funding. How do you accommodate that, and what are some sources of such funding? Um, yes. So, um, I, so okay. So, by no means are we, of course, and I think this is leading into another question that um, Agas had asked, which is that we are obviously not the only people who are doing experiments in India. There's obviously we're uh, part of a much larger environment, folks like like uh, JPAL um, uh, in IPA, Innovations for Poverty Action, uh, the Pusara Center, um, Ashoka's uh, Center for Social and Behavioral Change, um, Bias in New Delhi. So all of, all of these different institutions have now begun to sort of do, or not begun to do, they've been doing experiments for actually quite a bit of time. And we're just sort of part of that, um, you know, part of that same group, I would say, which is now growing in India, which is, which is why it's nice to have this talk and, you know, learn about more people who are interested in, in doing experiments. Um, I would say in terms of funding, so I know for a fact that these many of these other organizations that I just mentioned, um, they do raise funding from uh, sort of donor agencies or partnerships that they might have with governments, et cetera. Um, the main constraint is actually uh, trying to convince um, uh, another the source, usually the source of funding um, that an RCT is actually essential in this. So because for them, the status quo or sort of the normal way to do things is to just do a survey, right? And then sort of get an idea of what's happening in this village and then maybe go back and then do do a survey a few years later or something like that. So um, the, 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 so the more recent efforts that we've, uh, you know, uh, directed our efforts towards is uh, actually partnering with NGOs, partnering with civil society organizations, and sort of telling them that, look, the intervention that you're doing, the program that you're running is kind of um, very, very important. And it's probably having effects that you may not be able to measure from the way that you are measuring it, which is not to say that, you know, monitoring and evaluation teams, you know, aren't doing um, a good enough job, but it's just that um, as academics, we sort of bring this, you know, idea of how to maybe design and implement an experiment. And all we ask from them is, to be able to maybe implement this experiment in this particular way through our design and then help us collect the data because they have the context, they have the resources, they have the participants. Um, so in that sense, it, you know, that the whole issue of funding then reduces slightly in the sense that we're, it's actually not a very cost intensive activity either. Um, and as a nonprofit, we've got many complaints about how we don't charge anything. So I think uh, in, in that sense, uh, I don't know what that says about us, but it, it certainly means that um, there's obviously a much, that there's a lot of interest in sort of doing this uh, on a more larger scale. Um, but the source of funding, I'd say, you know, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation typically fund a lot of experiments. Uh, state governments have begun to fund mm -hmm. policy evaluations and policy experiments as well. Um, but I would still say that some, most of the funding you know, kind of comes from abroad. Like the, for example, the Indian Council for Social Sciences Research, like I'm, I'm not aware if they fund uh, or if they have ever funded um, experimental research. Um, yeah. They, and, they have uh, in psychology, just not. In psychology, right. Yeah. In, so, in the social sector, uh, things like that, they have in. Yeah. Um, okay, so I think uh, we are done with the questions.
uh, so being the moderator, I reserve the right for the last couple of questions that I have sure. in my mind. Yes. Okay. Uh, I mean, uh, there's a critique about experiments that uh, they often kind of establish certain kind of circumstantial causalities. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are endogeneity issues, et cetera, et cetera, with uh, experiments. And then there's the other issue, especially with natural experiments, that uh, these ex experiments are based on some kind of a priors. I mean, there's some prior, say, policy or something. So, I mean, while you are kind of trying to find the causal relationship be between the, uh, with respect to the priors, how do you actually prove the priors? So my two, my, I have two questions. One is with respect to the circumstantial causality and the other thing is how do you actually prove the priors before going on to do the natural experiment? Um, yeah, so I mean, I think in terms of proving the, that's, that's a very good question. So I mean, in terms of proving the priors, um, what, and especially if you're doing sort of something that might vary over time, I guess you might look at sort of establishing at the baseline itself, um, like what kind of, um, I don't know, you could say what kind of conditions exist, I guess you could say. So for what example, kind of right now, yeah, what kind of relationship exists? So right now, for example, we're working with an NGO who implemented um, a program in many different parts of India, et cetera, and they collected data at the baseline as well as, you know, a few years later at an end line. And uh, what we what we wanted to do as a first step is actually what you just described, which is kind of understand at the baseline, like without this NGO being there at all, um, like what's happening in terms of say something like school attendance. Right. So what are the factors that enable school? So then this gives us a very good idea of like it bereft of any sort of intervention or treatment or whatever randomization, et cetera. Like um, what are the factors that might enable school participation, school attendance, for example. Um, so that gives you a very good idea of a priori, like what's happening to this outcome of interest. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the circumstantial um, uh, uh, evidence, I mean, sorry, in terms of that, I would say that uh, that's a big critique of sort of RCTs right now in the sense that a lot of the effects that researchers find is often in that specific context. So it's, it's very mm -hmm. difficult for that to translate um, very easily like outside into different domains. And uh, many organizations that do RCTs for a very long time, especially like JPL have been sort of one of the main criticisms, criticisms there is that it's actually very costly um, to implement these RCTs and these field experiments, right? So um, the, the, I mean, there's no solution in sight there, but I think one of the main things is to a qualify the fact that, you know, to acknowledge that your outcome mm -hmm. is sort of a function of all of these different things that you did. And it's not necessary that if somebody else does the same thing in some other context that they're going to find the same thing. Uh, but the second thing that researchers have begun to do now, especially those that do RCTs. And I was very like, so there's this, there's this researcher called Manoj Mohanan, who's at uh, Duke. Um, and essentially what he did when he was describing his RCT was very nice because he actually described the cost of doing the RCT and then he put down the uh, cost per participant of doing the RCT. So these are things that um, people like about five or 10 years ago didn't use to do and they still don't do it today and that's the problem. But the idea is that it's important to report how much it costs to, for you to do this because that's an important aspect of replication, right? So in the sense that if you know how much it's gonna cost and if it costs X per participant, then immediately um, somebody who wants to replicate it will know how much money they exactly would need to raise in order to do that. So yeah, I would say that's important. I, I so my, think... my yeah, Sorry, please, no, please, please. Yeah, yeah, no please, I was please. just saying that um, also pre-registering the design of the RCT really helps because you are putting down, as I said, every detail of your uh, experimental protocol out in the open so that anybody who, who would want to replicate it has a good idea of what context within which that's going to um, work or uh, the context in which that is going to replicate the results from the original design. So it is definitely circumstantial causality, but uh, nearly all experiments are. <laughs> we haven't found, I mean, there's a reason why there aren't uh, laws of human behavior, uh, like the laws of gravity, for instance, because context determines everything. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, la last question. I mean, this is a primarily a more uh, personal question for you guys, and especially because I think Anirudh is a, has not yet completed his PhD, still working on his PhD, which is yeah. possibly not related to the kind of work he's doing at Mong Prayogshala. And Dr. Hansika has completed her PhD, right? Yes, yes. So, I mean, I, I would like to know for the benefit of all our doctoral participants, how do you guys manage time between your, I mean, uh, the prime activity of PhD and doing a non-profit kind of work 
in my Hmong Prayogshala? Uh, I don't know. HK, you want to go first? Or? Uh, yeah, I don't mind. Uh, so I have been doing this simultaneously during my master's as well as my PhD as well as my postdoc. Um, and it's been strange. I mean, I, I will not lie. <laughs> it's, uh, it's a very um, intense time management uh, activity in that sense. Uh, but at the same time, um, also, especially during my PhD, I couldn't do, I mean, for IP purposes, I couldn't do the same research that I was doing in my uh, doctorate as, as the stuff that I was doing at Prayogshala. But I think it's not, I mean, we work with a team of other researchers and um, it's very, it's been very, very um, supportive in that sense. We've had ups and downs in HR uh, recruitment and personnel, but at the same time, we work with a team of researchers and if some, if one of us drops the ball, at least in the department of psychology, I know that there are very, very um, well uh, trained and excellent researchers who are there to pick it up. So I think, um, I think that for me was a was a big uh, was a big help. I think. Yeah, and I mean for me, yeah, that, it has been challenging since I got into my PhD to balance sort of both um, work that I do at Monk, and especially because um, when I got into my PhD, I consciously made a decision to not take up a lot of new projects uh, at Monk because um, you know it was it was kind of a challenge um, to do that, and also because of the IP issues that Hansia mentioned. So um, I the main thing was to have a distinction in the areas of work that I do. So in the in the sense that the IP thing was actually a good thing for me because I could not work on the same thing that I was working on for my PhD. And um, I think it gives me a lot of freedom. And I think the only thing that really motivates me to continue working both on PhD as well as MP related work is um, really the fact that I get to do uh, whatever research that I, that I really intend to do, which is not a feature that is very common in research universities or other research institutions, right? Typically you're sort of told by a donor or by a agency or whoever is your boss to say that, you know, uh, do research on this, like it's nice. Um, so um, I think the freedom that we have at uh, Prayogshala is, uh, is both a characteristic of um, our ethos on research, but also more, more likely to be an outcome of the way that we've decided to set ourselves up. Uh, we hope to kind of continue, you know, doing research in the areas that we really want to do research in. Um, so yeah, we, we don't, we're still experimenting with this model, if you could call it that for, for some time. And hopefully after my PhD is done, uh, I can, I can design a new treatment for our experiment. Great, great. I think yeah. keep up the good work. I think you guys are you. actually doing a superb job uh, apart from your regular research. Yes. So I think, uh, thank you all for uh, participating in the session. I'll hand it over to the RJ of Radio Sofia, uh, Pranti. She'll take it over from you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Madhuri, and thank you very, very much, Anirudh and Hatsika, for giving your time. And this is the fourth talk in the series of the Doctoral Lab. So, and I'm glad it's going very good and it's been very helpful because some of us have done the courses on behavioral economics and experiments but some of mm -hmm. us have not at IIM Calcutta. And also I think it's because it's a new discipline, not many institutes still have full-fledged courses. So I think this would be of great help. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, for all the participants, so this talk will be uploaded to Radio Sofia YouTube channel. Uh, and there are also, so all the other uh, earlier talks, recordings of it are also available, so you can access them. And in case if you are interested to know more about us, you can write to Radio Sofia 2020 at uh, gmail.com and also Hansika and Anirudh have provided their email IDs as well. So mm -hmm. it's 80 at Mount Yeah, right? 80 dot I. Yeah. Dot I. Yeah. 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 And right. uh, HK at Mount Prayagshala. And you, there's a website and they have a social media page so you can all, always follow. So yeah. yeah. So I hope we'll meet sometime in person. Yeah. 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 So thank you very much. Yeah. Once again, thanks so much, Kranti, okay. and thanks so much. Uh, thank oh, sorry, uh, Himadri has left, but thanks so much for having us. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Bye. Thank Have you. Bye. Bye. Thanks you. you too.